Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kaya Carrington Russell, Australian award winning author of contemporary romance and kick butt heroines and fantasy worlds. And I have a very special guest for you today. We are talking New York Times Nebula and Hugo award winning author, known for her urban fantasy and science fiction thrillers. Also known for books such as October Days and Into the Drowning Deep, we are talking to the one and only Sean and McGuire Amira Grant. How are you today? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. And, you know, on the one and only thing, my friend Brooke likes to say that none of me would be too few, but two of me would be way, way too many. I love that, but it could no. be trouble as well. Yep, we're, we're good with the quantity available. I love that. Well, take me back to the start because I... I was so flooded. When I started doing research, my jaw unhinged at the amount that you've achieved in your career. And I would just love to know what your career started at. Like, why did you start writing and how was your journey into publishing for the first time? I mean, I started writing uh, initially because no one told me that I couldn't. And I kept writing because I had discovered uh, fan fiction to a certain degree. Uh, and I discovered that if you were a girl who wanted to have adventures that weren't just about romance and just about falling in love, and there's nothing wrong with romance. Romance is a fabulous genre. A lot of my friends write it, but if that wasn't the only thing you wanted, then by God, you had to write them yourself. Um, so I started doing that, and I, I did fanfic for quite a long time. Um, I still do. It's a wonderful space to work in, uh, but I finished some original stuff, met my agent, and was able to convince her that I would probably be capable of finishing a book and she should try to sell one for me. And how did that look? Because that was quite, that was over a decade ago. So how did that look then pitching to agents? So I tell people I have the purple unicorn path to publishing. You, you really can't look at my path and expect that anything like it is ever gonna happen to anyone, including me. There's a non-zero chance I don't exist. Uh, I met my agent because she was a friend of a friend who had enjoyed my Buffy the Vampire Slayer porn. Uh, now, again, I don't really, I don't really do romance for my uh, original work. It's, it's not where my joy is and it's not where my talents lie. Um, my agent will discourage me from trying to write sexy fun times as much as possible because frankly they're not any fun when I'm the one writing them uh, it's it's very like oh someone who does not care about sex is writing sex why am I here when I could just be on AO3 um, but uh, she had read my Buffy the Vampire Slayer porn she was working with an agency at the time and was thinking of breaking off and starting her own agency, which is the natural life cycle of agents. Like a junior agent will sign on with an established firm. They'll spend a couple of years working with that firm's clients, and then they'll split off and become their own agency. And she was on the cusp of doing that. Um, so she asked the mutual friend, do we know anyone who is doing original fic and hasn't been able to get signed yet? And the mutual friend said, well, Shannon's over there. And so she she came over and we talked for well over a year before she finally went, you know what? Yeah, I think you're ready. Why don't we go ahead and do this? Mm -hmm. uh, so we went out with Rosemary and Rue initially as the thing that was most done. And if you asked me what kind of author I wanted to be at that exact moment in time, you know, what space I want to be working in, I would say urban fantasy was really where I wanted to live. So that made the most sense as an initial offering. I belong to a sub-community, a Spanish sub-community in the United States called Filk Music, mm -hmm. which is the music of science fiction and fantasy. Um, so it's songs about Star Trek or Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or anything like that. And we have our own conventions and we have our own gatherings. And I've been quite active in Filk for quite some time. And uh, Tanya Huff, who is a Canadian science fiction author that wrote the books that became um, Blood Ties, the Blood Ties TV series, is also a filker. Mm -hmm. And so we were ready to go out on submission with Rosemary and Rue. I said to Tanya, will you read my book so I can have what's called a sales blur? 
And those are not necessary. You don't need to have a sales blurb, but if you can get an established author to read your shit and say, yeah, this isn't terrible, that will usually help you get a couple of editors to take a look. And uh, she read my book and said, this is really good. I really like it. And I like you as a person. Can I introduce you to my editor? So she just introduced my agent straight to her editor. We had a 10 day submission to sale period which is so unrealistic and has completely messed with my idea of the time scale on everything else I have ever sold. Wow. Uh, so what did it look like then compared to what it looks like today? I don't know. What did it look like then compared to what it looked like ever? I, I, I don't know. It, it looked like I had spent a long time accidentally putting all of the pieces into place to have them fall the way I needed them to when it came time. What was that first book that you published and what year? Rosemary and Rue. It came out in 2009. 2009. That's incredible. I want to talk a little bit about your well-loved series, October Days. For those who haven't yet started and they need to, what is it about and where did you get the inspiration for it? So the October Day books are about a woman named October. Um, and, and where I got the primary inspiration for it was that I went to college here in the States. I went to university for a dual major in folklore and herpetology, the study of fairy tales and the study of snakes. Um, do you know what you can do with a dual major in folklore and herpetology? Basically, you can sell fries at McDonald's or you can write fantasy novels. You, you don't really have a, a lot of choice there other than those things. And I decided fantasy novels would be more fun. Um, so I went ahead and just rolled with that. Um, so part of the inspiration was that I wanted to write a book about what my degree is in. I, I wanted to be able to use what I had spent a ridiculous amount of time and money uh, smashing into my head in some way. And I wanted to be able to continue to tax deduct really obscure, expensive folklore books uh, which my agent wishes, I, not my agent, my agent doesn't care, but uh, my accountant wishes I would stop doing. Um, the specific inspiration for the Toby books was I was at the Golden Gate Park Japanese Tea Gardens, which is just a little botanical garden in uh, in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And I had decided to climb up the Moon Bridge, which is a sheer half circle bridge. Why did I decide to do this? No one knows. Did I get stuck at the top? Yes, I fucking did. And so I'm just standing, I'm clinging to the top of the moon bridge, absolutely convinced I'm going to die up there because there's no way I'm ever getting down. Um, and, and watching the koi swim beneath me, which are these great, big, beautifully patterned, you know, kind of goldfish creatures. And, and they're neat to watch. And they're terrifying when you think they're going to be eating your corpse in short order. And I suddenly just had the, the thought, Spending 14 years as a koi in Golden Gate Park's Japanese tea gardens does very little for one's outlook on life. And that was the moment when I met Toby, um, who was very cynical. She's a very grumpy girl initially. She's a little less cynical now after 16 books. Um, but I went home after they finally got me down from the moon bridge and wrote a 14 page short story, which was, I thought, all the story that there was there. I, I really thought it was just this little character study. And it was fine. Um, and it was, to be fair, the best thing I had written up until that point, but it was also over. There was no plot. Well, my girlfriend at the time really, really liked it. And so she read that and, and she goes to me and goes, Toby wants a novel. And I'm like, well, Toby doesn't have enough story to sustain a novel. There is no novel there. Toby wants a novel. And since she controlled access to her breasts, which I was extremely fond of, I sat down and I wrote Toby's novel basically so that the makeouts would continue. That's incredible. How do you find 16 books later? Have you ever struggled with following through with theme or style or anything like that or even remembering certain plot parts like, oh, can't do this or rules that you've applied to your fantasy world? Have you ever struggled after writing such a long series? I keep really comprehensive notes. I do forget things like what was that minor character we last saw six books ago's eye color, um, but everything else I've got fairly well written down and charted out. I know where we where we're going. I've known where we were going for a very long time. Um, I am 
little bit astonished by the fact that I am still able to keep going, not because I'm running out of, of steam, but because it's very rare for a series to make it this long. And I'm just honestly hoping that we can keep up what momentum we have until I reach the ending. I want to write the end. What does your nine till five look like? And are you a plotter or a plant, uh, pantser? What does your routine look like? I mean, I get out of bed. I, um, I get a Diet Dr. Pepper, which is my caffeinated beverage of choice. And I pretty much, unless I have something else that I have to do that day that is already on the calendar and scheduled, I sit down and I start writing. And I continue writing with small breaks for necessary things like, you know, using the bathroom or petting a cat or eating lunch or whatnot. Um, I continue writing until I hit that day's word count target. And that varies day by day. Um, had a few things get kind of messed up over the summer, which knocked me off on targets. So right now I literally have each day's word count target on my Google calendar. And it's the very first thing I see when I open up my calendar in the morning um, is where do I have to be by the end of this day to feel that I have actually done my job. And once I get to that target, once I hit the number, I get to delete the number from the calendar. So the last interaction I have with each piece of work is making it look like I did fuck all. <laughs> but that's okay, because I know, and, and my agent knows, she has full visibility on all of this. Because, um, you know, part of her job is promising people that I will actually do my job is going to people and saying, oh, no, I know, I know on paper she looks really overcommitted, but trust me, this is just how she is. She'll do it. She, it's fine. So she needs that visibility. Um, and I, I work till I'm done. And then I stop. I determine whether I can take on a job, whether I actually have that bandwidth to do it by literally sitting down and counting days and counting the number of words that I can generate per day to figure out if I am still in the space of, yeah, okay, that's easy versus, yeah, we're getting a little questionable here, honey, versus, oh, dear God, if you even sneeze, everything is going to fall apart. And do you, after having been doing this for so long, are you still writing as much as you were at the start or are you now writing more or... And do you have days off? Do you sleep? I mean, I do sleep. Uh, if nothing else, the cats will sit on me. Um, days off are a bit more esoteric of a concept. It's it's not something that really makes a huge amount of sense to me um, on an emotional, intellectual level. If I take a formalized day off, like here is a day when I don't have to do any writing at all, um, statistically, you will find me writing something before the end of the day. It'll just be something that I don't have to be writing um, because this is what I love to do. Um, and it's it's really odd because you, you keep commenting on how long I've been doing this. But really, you know, my first book came out in 2009. That is 13 years. I had a full time day job for the first eight years of that. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't feel like that long at all. Yeah. It never. Has. When did you decide to make the shift then? As you said, you were obviously working as well for eight years in that time. Were you nervous about going full-time author or were you really ecstatic about that? I mean, a little bit of both. Uh, I used to work for a nonprofit organization dedicated to bridging the digital divide by assisting other nonprofit organizations with technological solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can tell I worked there for quite some time by how well I can still rattle that off. And I liked the work we did. I liked the mission that we had. But that particular job, because it was a nonprofit, um, at least in the States, nonprofit organizations will generally pay you less than mm -hmm. for profit organizations because they have less money and they make up for that in part by giving you more vacation time they give you more time off than a for-profit company would and this particular company closed every year from christmas eve through to new year's it was just closed and people would take these long vacations that made all the people who had made fun of us for having no money at all 
uh, very, very jealous. And we hit my last Christmas with the company and I was supposed to go to Maine, which is on the other side of the continent from where I was living at the time in California to visit my friend, Catherine Valenti. And we got to where work closed and the thought of doing anything at all was literally paralyzing. I was working effectively 120 hours a week. I would do a full eight hour work day with a two hour commute each way, get home, eat something, sit down and start writing to make my commitments. And uh, I broke, something just sh- just snapped. I spent that entire week between Christmas and New Year's lying on the couch in my living room, watching reruns of Law & Order SVU and crying. And uh, when I went back to work, I, I pretty much walked in and told my boss, I can't, I, I have to go now. And to his credit, he did not attempt to stop me. Also to his credit, I'm pretty sure he had been expecting that for a while by that point. Um, but so it was less less sadness and more just, I, I cannot do this. You cannot burn the candle at both ends forever. Out of all of that, when was Mira Grant born, your second pen name? When did you decide to pivot into a new uh, genre? Well, I said we went out first with Rosemary and Rue. Feed was already done. Mm -hmm. So we went out with Feed on submission before Rosemary and Rue was released. And that was a more realistic um, submissions process. You know, it it took more than a week. Um, But uh, bookstores are run by computers. And computers are not smart. They mimic intelligence because we tell them to, but people keep trying to say, oh, there's no prejudices, there's no racism, there's no this, there's no that, because it's the algorithm, as if people don't build algorithms, as if people don't program things. And so bookstore computers, when they are deciding what a bookstore is going to order, and this is more of a factor with large chain bookstores, with Barnes and Noble, with Borders in the Day, um, all of that. But when it's deciding what to order, they base the number of books they're going to buy off the number of books that author's last book sold. So if your first book sells 10 copies across a bookstore chain, that's great. The bookstore will now order eight copies of your next book because they're pretty sure that they can sell them. And you will not have an opportunity to sell 10 books unless they get a restock request. And the way that you can sometimes get around that is book one sells 10 copies, whatever. Book two, they order eight copies. All eight of them sell instantly. The bookstore will reorder 10. But as I mentioned, I went out with Rosemary and Rue at a time where the general wisdom held that urban fantasy was was over, that it was a dead, very soon to be completely gone subgenre. And none of the publishers we spoke to about Feed, which is a biotechnological science fiction thriller, wanted to yoke the bookstore owners for their debut science fiction novel to the sales that they were already predicting was going to be a failed urban fantasy. And there, there's nothing wrong with them thinking it was going to fail. I mean, statistically and looking at all of the information that was available, it should have failed. The fact that it didn't was pure luck. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, basically all of them said, you have to have a pseudonym if you want to pivot this hard into another genre. And I'm honestly glad that they did. It's not just the bookstore order. order. It's not just the bookstore orders. It's also market, marketing and marketability. Urban fantasy is very widely regarded as a girl's genre. It's for female readers. And because of that, there are a surprising number of readers who just won't read it. They will not buy an urban fantasy. And um, I, I thought that this was an exaggeration. I thought it was kind of bullshit until about the 20th person that came up to me at a signing and went, you are my favorite author, you know, feed changed my life, best zombie book ever, blah, blah, blah. I would never have read it if I had been aware that it was you. Wow. So, and that's just the people that admitted it. What writing advice do you have then for authors who are wanting to step into these genres uh, when it comes to reader expectations or world building? Do you have any advice or tips? 
I mean, one of the big things I will say is that urban fantasy readers are much savvier now than they were not all that long ago. They they wow. actually have standards, which is good. You want your readers to have standards. And they are watching to see if you can do something new in that space. They are also watching to see if you are being considerate, if you are being thoughtful of the worlds that you're moving into. A huge amount of urban fantasy as a genre is built on folklore. Mm -hmm. much built on folklore. And one of the things that you see, especially from white authors, is a tendency to turn other people's gods into our monsters. To just go, oh, that creature looks cool. I'm going to pick it up and wander away with it. And it's going to be fine because it's folklore. It's not always. You have to be respectful when you are approaching a culture that is not your own. Um, so the first thing I'd say is if you want to write urban fantasy, find something new to say. Don't just be writing another Dresden Files knockoff or another this or another that. Be writing the first of you and consider all of the things that you're pulling in. You want to be as open as possible to non-European folklore, to working in new spaces, but you want to be sure that you're going to those places in a respectful manner, um, because these stories are not all necessarily ours to colonize or tell. The big thing with zombies is people are picky about their zombie shit these days. You know, we're living through a literal global pandemic. A lot of the things that we always assumed were not true. You know, if you watch most disease fiction, if you watch most stories about viruses, um, there was rioting in the streets after 3,000 people died. People got upset. People cared. It was not let grandma die to save the economy. Um, so you do have to consider that you are now writing for an audience that has lived through some of these things, whereas people who were writing the books that you loved were not necessarily. We have now learned that 90% of the people we love would hide a zombie bite. Would just decide they were the one, ex the one exemption to everyone who gets bitten turns. And they would come into your house having just been bitten and they would pick up your child. This is really like, I'm loving, yeah. would you believe you have a way with words? But I think it's really important in the way that you're addressing as well, taking other cultures and folklores and things like that. I imagine that you do a lot of research. Obviously, you studied this for years, but mm -hmm. for every book that you write, do you do a lot of research as well? Not for the Toby books anymore, because that world is is very much built. And there are aspects of that world that I honestly wish I could go back and change. Um, I was very young when I started that series. You know, we mentioned that I studied folklore for years, and I did. But I was studying folklore when we had not yet really started decolonializing the approach to the study of folklore. So there were a lot of things that I learned regarding making other people's gods your monsters and regarding whether or not a story was a shiny thing I could pick up and wander off with that are not necessarily good things to have learned. And I've had to work really actively at unlearning them and still am. Um, so, you know, that is a factor. But the Toby series, the rules are there. They're printed. I can't change them. Um, I have to work with what I can and try to be sensitive and considerate within that space. Uh, so I don't really have to research those that much anymore. I just take what's already there, kick it a couple times, and then get it back into gear. Uh, here at Grant Books are where I do the majority of my research uh, because that is science. And I am a lady-shaped person. I am a cis female who identifies as female and uses she, her pronouns. And this means my science and hard science fiction gets criticized about five times more stringently than my male peers. Uh, that is not a joke. It's not an exaggeration. We both wish it were. So be meticulous at all times. Um, and therefore, when I am being Mira Grant, when I am setting up a Mira story, I do an ungodly amount of research. I have infected myself with live parasites. I have milked deadly snakes. I have visited high security biotech labs to go ahead and get into a room with diseases that could literally melt me to make sure that I could accurately describe those experiences and those things. Um, and that's just a lot of research. It's fun, 
I enjoy it, but God, it's a lot of work. I'm just like so in the live parasites, like all of that I want to know more on, but am I able to delve into a little bit and ask what your experiences were with the live parasites? Well, the live parasites was a live parasite. His name was Timmy. He was a tapeworm and uh, he was with me for approximately two and a half years. He was only supposed to be with me for two years. Um, but my first course of antiparasitics did not work. Um, I am, I am very science oriented. I like to read the research. I like to do the research. I like to understand what's going on. And therefore the during COVID obsession with ivermectin is the key was hilarious because one ivermectin is not the key. Yes. Ivermectin kills COVID in a Petri dish, but at those doses, ivermectin also kills you. Majority of, of medicines, but especially the majority of antiparasitics, the difference between medicine and poison is the dose. And you're kind of racing to see, will this kill the thing that is hurting me before it kills me? And with ivermectin, if, if your goal is eradication of COVID, no, it will not kill the COVID before it kills you. Um, but even more than that, we used two courses of ivermectin to get rid of my tapeworm. It's not a fun drug, y'all. You will shit out the entire lining of your digestive system. It is a genuinely uncomfortable sensation. Nothing about it is fun. It's cramping. It's suffering. And then it takes 10 years for your guts to recover afterward. So you get 10 years of side effects and discomfort for swallowing horse dewormer that you shouldn't have been taking because it doesn't kill COVID. What made you want to do that? Like, obviously, you're very hands-on with your research, which is why I'm so intrigued, because not many authors would put themselves in that situation. I, I think you kind of underestimate how many authors are faintly out of our minds. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to do the ivermectin because it was the only way to get rid of the tapeworm. Um, as to why I wanted the tapeworm, I was writing a trilogy uh, called Parasitology. It's one of the Mira Grant series about the hygiene hypothesis, which is a scientific hypothesis that holds that recent rises in allergies and autoimmune disorders can be directly traced to the elimination of parasitic load in the human population. Basically, our immune systems are bored, and so they're just sort of hitting things with bats. And uh, I wanted to know and actually be able to accurately describe, because I would know whether having a parasite, having a tapeworm living with me, would impact my experiences of allergies and autoimmune conditions and things like that. Um, so I went to the Minnesota Museum of Parasitology and I got a tapeworm to be able to accurately talk about this experience. Did it affect you? Oh, it did. I had fewer colds. I had, um, so I only have a couple of allergies and at least one of them is life-threatening. So I didn't play allergy chicken with that one but um i had fewer phlegm reactions to eating things i had less cases where i was like oh i don't know if i should have done that and on the on the whole i felt much better now i was also under medical supervision the entire time and taking special bat spe special vitamins i almost said special batteries god special vitamins but also having regular monitoring tests to make sure that my tapeworm wasn't really doing much other than hanging out in my gut and causing my immune responses to focus in that area. What would you say then the most surprising thing is that you found within this industry that you weren't expecting when you went into it, whether it's in regards to writing or publishing or the entire industry itself? I honestly thought because I was a sweet, naive, little, uh, little American girl, you know, where they tell us it's a meritocracy. Everyone knows it's not a meritocracy, but they tell us that it is. I honestly thought that all you had to do was write a good book. And if your books were good, you would have success. And that would be true. And I've done pretty well. I'm not complaining, but I have seen so many people write genuinely, astonishingly good books and just not find that audience just not catch for whatever reason. 
and I'll read their books and be like, this is, this is a modern classic. This is something that we should be teaching everywhere. This is incredible. And it doesn't hook because so much of this is luck. Yeah. So much of everything is luck. Um, you know, Travis Baldry just published a book called Legends and Lattes, which is lovely. And if you haven't read it, I hugely recommend it. It's a very sweet kind of cozy fantasy. And he self-published it initially. And in, I think, early February, he posted the cover and said, this is my upcoming book, Legends and Lattes. And somebody linked me to it. And I like tieflings from Dungeons and Dragons. They are my favorite species of player character. And it had a tiefling on the cover. So I retweeted it and was like, this looks really cool. I'm excited about it. And then I finally read it and I loved it. So I reviewed it on Twitter. And Travis got a sales spike that literally drove him up above the top 100 on Amazon and has since gotten a traditional publishing contract for that book. And now I have I have indie, indie authors, independently published authors, reaching out to me almost every day going, can you, can you do this for me? And I'm like, there's not a tiefling on the cover of your book. I mean, this was not, I didn't know Travis. He didn't bribe me. I was lucky that I saw the cover. He was lucky that I saw the cover. It's all luck. It's all, it's all just did the times work out for you. One thing that I'm intrigued about is you, you have so many accolades. You're a New York Times bestselling author, Hugo, Nebula. And when I saw all the awards that you won, my jaw unhinged. I was like, wow. But I'm curious as to, with all of that, that most would, from the outside view, is success. If there was one moment or one particular award that was the most sentimental to you and, most importantly, how you celebrated that for yourself. So I was nominated in 2010 for what was then the John W. Campbell Award. They have since changed the name of the award, um, and I, I can't remember what they changed it to. The name just does not stick. It's the astonishing or the astounding or something. But when I won it, it was still the Campbell. Um, I was nominated. It was the first time I had been nominated for a major award. Um, and my foster mother, I was in foster care in high school, and my foster mother, Catherine Doherty, was the award administrator that year she was the one responsible for making sure that the show went off properly that everything happened the way it was supposed to and she was an incredibly ethical woman she the hugos and the campbell which was so is associated but is not a hugo for decades um and she knew that i get test anxiety from anything voted i get severe test anxiety i had not been able to keep food down for i think five days prior to the Hugo ceremony. Like I, if I ate something, I would just vomit. I was not okay. I lost 10 pounds over the course of the world con, which is not what's supposed to happen. And she came up to me the morning of the ceremony while I was pretending to have breakfast with a friend and said, I got to pick the processional music for the Campbell Award this year. And so that's great. That's the music they play while the person is walking up the stage to accept the award. And, yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. And she says, I picked the theme to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Okay, cool. It was about two years later that I realized she had tried to tell me I had won so that maybe I would be able to eat something, um, which is the only time I ever knew her to in any way even skirt up against breaking a rule. And she got to, she presented that one herself. Um, when they have someone come out to read the envelope, there's always a presenter who comes out with the award to hand it to the winner. And, um, Honestly, the Buffy thing didn't tip me off. I should have realized I had won when Catherine came out on stage with the plaque. And so she got to hand me the plaque and she passed away, I think two years later of, uh, of cancer. Um, so she never got to give me my Hugo, but she got to give me my Campbell and that meant a lot to her and that meant a lot to me. So that's incredible. I love that. Wow. And it's so interesting that because as soon as you said Buffy, I knew straight away. <laughs> but it's interesting because you're obviously so stressed that you didn't realize. Mm -hmm. What would you say your greatest challenge and your greatest accomplishment has been so far in your writing career? I mean, my greatest challenge is that I, I have no idea how many words I've written at this point, but it's kind of horrifying. Um, a couple of million words. My greatest challenge really is convincing them to let me keep publishing at the rate that my sanity kind of demands that I do. 
Um, when Hamilton came out and you have that song, Why Do You Write Like You're Running Out of Time? Every person I've ever met sent me that within a week. I refused to see Hamilton for quite some time because I was pissed off because people wouldn't stop sending me that song. But we forget about women very quickly as a culture. If you look back over the history of literature, um, over the history of science fiction especially, but I think any genre, it is just littered with these women who wrote two, three brilliant novels, and then they stopped publishing, and then we just forgot they were there. We will keep recommending books that men wrote 80 years ago while erasing all of their female peers or saying, oh no, we read Mary Shelley, like reading Mary Shelley makes up for the 800 women we've just deleted. So I've always known that if I want to be remembered, if I want to have actually brought something to this field that I genuinely love, I have to keep working. I don't get to stop. Because if I stop, I'm gone. And, you know, the way I, I came out of the gate with a book um, and followed up with three more in the next year, and I've pretty much done that consistently since, um, I was not a new kid. I didn't get to be a new kid. My second year of Hugo eligibility, I had people saying, Sean and McGuire's on the ballot, as always, like I had been one of the usual suspects for a decade. And that is because I had so much published so quickly that people assumed I must have been around for decades. Yeah. So I went from not existing on the screen, on the scene at all, from being no one to being old and established in five minutes. And now that I've been doing this for 13 years, I have to keep running as hard as I can because if I stop, then I'm just one of those old fogies that fell off the back end of the boat that we didn't actually need anymore. Yeah. Um, the pace, I think, really is the biggest challenge. The knowing, just because I know how society works, that I can't stop. And it sounds like I'm whining if I say that, you know. Oh, no, I don't get to rest. I must work forever. Well, yeah, you kind of must. Patrick Rothfuss, sec Patrick Rothfuss had his second book come out the same day as my fourth. People are not forgetting him. Yeah. But people are forgetting all of the other women who debuted my year that didn't manage to make it to the next one. If you're comfortable with talking a little bit about it, because you're not the first female fantasy or science fiction author that I've interviewed, and quite a few of them have come up with this barrier as well, and I think it's important that we talk about it. Behind the scenes, us women are really fighting for each other and supporting each other, but I also don't think it's spoken about enough in conversations like this to be addressed openly as well. So have you had, obviously you've explained a couple of situations, but for example, one of the previous authors was discussing how she was so easily disregarded on panels and she was the only mm -hmm. female sitting there. Have you had experiences like that? Oh, as yeah. Well? Yep. Generally on panels. Um, my favorite was one where they asked about the, you know, somebody asked about science fiction and research and the male author next to me says it's all made up. We invent everything because it's fiction and we're allowed and gets a round of applause, which is fine. You know, yay him. The very next question is somebody criticizing the fact that I used a single scientific term wrong in the Newsflash trilogy. He's like, you know, Mira, in your Newsflash trilogy, you use the word micron as a unit of measure for viruses. You know that that's incorrect and, and goes on to like start nitpicking my science right after the whole room had been applauding a man saying he invented everything he did. And that is, that is so consistent. Um, you know, the Mary Sue treatment of any female character. I'm a fanfic author. An original fiction character, a character in a book that is not fanfic, even if it's licensed IP work, cannot be a Mary Sue. Mary Sue has a meaning. A Mary Sue is a cuckoo. She is a character from outside the canon placed inside the canon who warps the canon around her. Even if your female hero is incredibly ridiculously overpowered, if she is a native to that canon, if that's where she's from, she's not a Mary Sue. She's just a fucking chosen one. Yeah. We don't call male characters Mary Sue. We call them chosen ones. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, seeing I've had my books filed in paranormal romance over and over again because there's a girl on the cover and a female name on the cover. I write really bad paranormal romance. Really bad. Uh, the October Day Book series is up to 16. The Encrypted series just had number 11 come out. It took until book 11 in those two in Encrypted. So 27 books all total took until book 11 in Encrypted for there to be on-screen sex. And it's it's not very sexy sex. Like the characters are having a good time. You can tell they're having a good time. But they're talking about siege engines while they undress each other. Because that is for them what flirting looks like. Um, so that's a lot. There is, is at least one job I know I did not get because the editor did not think I looked good enough on panels to be a representative. To be a representative. Um, I have had people tell me that fat female authors should just stay home because we damage our own brand by being seen in public. And relatively early, um, I'm going to say about 2011, Patrick Rothfuss and I were on a panel together. And to Pat's credit, he was infuriated when this happened. But Patrick Rothfuss and I were on a panel together. And he's about a foot taller than I am. But in all other dimensions, we are the same size. We are both chubby people, you know, with kind of frizzy hair. I am wearing a nice blouse. My hair is clearly combed. I am wearing light makeup. I've made an effort. I may not be Julia Roberts in Notting, in Notting Hill, but I have clearly made an effort. Pat, on the other hand, is wearing a t-shirt. His beard is giant, bushy, and unbrushed. You can tell what he had for breakfast because it's on his shirt. And someone took a picture of the two of us on this panel, put it on their blog, and captioned it the distinguished Mr. Rothfuss and the cheerfully obese Ms. McGuire and didn't see anything wrong with that. And so many of these things, these little microaggressions, these little sexist acts, we can see, we know that they are there, but if you try to explain them to someone who's never encountered them or never experienced them, you know, they sent me on book tour for Parasites. So I went to a whole bunch of different bookstores and I found very quickly that if I just walked in and said, hi, I'm your author, where do you want me? They treated me like I was some rando off the street. I completely unprofessionally. But if I put on mascara, walked in and said the exact same line, suddenly I was a working professional. Mm -hmm. So I spent the whole book tour experimenting with how much makeup was too little or too much. Um, any makeup at all got me better results. But I could go down to just glitter eyeliner, which is about as unprofessional as a gem doll and still be treated more like a professional than if I walked in barefaced. The standards are completely irregular. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are a community that has to boost each other up. We have to help each other. There is no one else out there. Frequently, you will run into authors, and I hate this is generalizing, but it's almost always male authors, cis male authors specifically. You'll run into authors who have a great reputation for helping people. You know, they're always willing to give a helping hand and lift you up. And then you look at who they're willing to lift up and it's always attractive women 10 years their junior. Yeah. And they don't have a helping hand for the ugly girls and they don't have a helping hand for the girls their age or the girls older than them. And they don't have a helping hand for the guys. Mm -hmm. But if a hot girl, they are happy to help her up. And that is sexism too. It's not fair to the hot girls because they are being treated like pieces of meat. And it's not fair to the ugly girls because they are being shut out of opportunities that is are being offered to people that are considered more conventionally attractive. How did you handle becoming an author, especially when you want to make this a full-time career and really put yourself out there? You open yourself to that kind of criticism and to have blogs such as that's absolutely disgusting. What kind of conversations did you have to have with yourself to not necessarily accept it, but move on from it and still be confident and comfortable with writing your next book and continuing this career. You know, I, um, so before I did full-time fantasy writing, I did stand-up comedy. I, um, I had severe anxiety as a kid. And so they enrolled me in stand-up comedy classes to try and, and keep that from being an issue. And you cannot be a fat woman with frizzy hair and a gap between your two front teeth doing stand-up comedy and not get used to people making fun of the way you look. I don't like it. Um, I am ridiculously thin-skinned. 
-hmm. when I'm actually sitting back and living my own life and being left alone. And I had already just had to learn to take it. I had teachers that literally taught me how to take it. Uh, But even more than that, I am an autistic woman living in America who went through the public school system. That horribly enough is an absolute education and everything you are is wrong and gross and disgusting that you take day by day. Uh, But fanfic taught me a lot about accepting criticism of my writing and not taking it personally. And also about understanding that you can and will put things in your books that you don't know you're putting there. And when people call you on them, the correct thing to say is thank you, not how dare you. You know, I've mentioned several times that I am a woman from America who grew up in American culture. And I think it's important to point out where you're from and what was drilled into you growing up. But we have a strong, strong culture. uh, It's not quite the same as tall poppy syndrome, but it's very similar. Smurfette syndrome. There is room for one girl in any given group. So a lot of nerdy girls, a lot of smart girls develop kind of a not like other girls syndrome. And we internalize a huge amount of misogyny. We judge other women in ways that we would not want to be judged ourselves. We think that the girl who makes herself look nice to come to the party, is just doing it because she wants to get the guys. We think the girl that doesn't do anything is a slob. And and that is drilled into us by society. I'm not saying I think those things now. Um, But I had a lot of that to unlearn. And if you read Feed, which I am still very proud of, it's a good book. But if you read Feed, you can see that because Georgia Mason, who is my female point of view character, doesn't like other women and it comes through. Every other woman, except for her friend Buffy, there is something wrong with them. And that is absolutely authorial bias showing up where it didn't necessarily belong. Um, So I already learned through fanfic that when people call me on that, I have to be ready to accept it and listen to it. Um, and, And so I just try to take it in a good spirit. Oh, I love that answer. Thank you. What would your advice be for anyone who is looking to go the traditional route? And I'm curious, have you ever considered going indie yourself? If you want to go the traditional route, you do need to remember that all of the time scales are going to be so long. It's so long. You know, part of why I was happy to be more than one person is I'm a big Stephen King fan. And I remember when he was Richard Bachman and he was Richard Bachman in part because otherwise his publishers would not publish enough to keep up with him. Um, And having two names let me publish more. And that helped a lot. Uh, But everything takes for it happens very slowly and then it happens very fast. Um. But you don't have to do a lot of the work. I I have not really considered going the indie route, not because there's anything wrong with indie, but because I am, this is going to sound weird, but I am fundamentally lazy as hell. I know, but what I want to do is sit in this chair, write my books, have this horrible, stupid pandemic end so that I can go back to Disney World and resume traveling around and doing stuff. And if I have to market, design covers, copy edit, all of those other things, that is time that I'm not writing or doing things that I enjoy doing. Um, I am so impressed by indie authors. I am genuine, and this is not sarcasm at all. I am genuinely in awe of the fact that you fuckers can basically do the authorial equivalent of the dishes on a regular basis. Here, if I do the laundry before I develop a mouse problem, there is something going up. Um, I, I just, I, I can't, I can't imagine. I have a Patreon and I publish one story a month and it is not infrequent that the person who does my file formatting for me gets a request at the absolute fucking 11th hour going, oh God, can you make me a PDF? Because I just, I forgot. It wasn't there. Wasn't important enough. It wasn't word count. 
Well, that answers my question then as to whether you'll go indeed no, because we want time for Disneyland and I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't wait. What is the big goal for you? What is the dream that you are chasing for your author career? I mean, at this point I, I've kind of I've kind of knocked most of them out. I would really like to do more comic books. I have incredibly enjoyed my comic work. Um, because comics are essentially it's a structured poem it's a 20 to 40 page structured poem and I find that process really enjoyable I would like an X-Men ongoing that's probably still my greatest career goal that I haven't achieved I've done an X-Men one shot and an X-Men an X-Men miniseries and I had a ghost spider ongoing for a while at Marvel uh, till COVID killed it but I would really like an X-Men ongoing Um, can you explain a little bit more as in like your writing an X-Men series, is that correct? I'm not currently. Um, I do a lot of what's called IP work or licensed tie-in work. And that is kind of what if fanfic, but people can tell you when you're wrong and also you get paid for it and it's considered canon now. So weird. Um, But I wrote the X-Men Gold Annual with Kitty Pride in 2018. I wrote the X-Men Black Mystique issue. And I wrote the Astonishing Nightcrawler uh, miniseries as part of the Age of X-Men event. And then I did two years on the Ghost Spider, which is Gwen Stacy um, as as Spider Woman um, comic. And, And I just, I loved it. I loved it so much. I really, comics are very important to me. They've always been a part of my life. And I want to go back. I'm not currently doing anything at Marvel. Marvel, call me! Um, But I want to go back. And right now I'm doing periodic comics for Boom for their Magic the Gathering title. Um, But uh, I'm also doing currently a lot of work for Wizards of the Coast for their Magic the Gathering magic story. And that is writing the stories that go along with the card set. And I love it. I want to do more. I am plotting a slow, corrosive internal takeover. Because you do a lot of reveals on Instagram as well. I saw that, that you um, do a lot of unpacking and things like that for that as well, don't you? Well, I'm currently doing a Magic the Gathering uh, kind of advent calendar um, where I spent the whole year gathering packs from older sets of the card game. And now I'm just opening one per day. And that's because I am not Christian, but I love advent calendars. I love countdown calendars. There's just something so soothing about today you'll get a present. Mm-hmm. And that is the exact same present you got yesterday, but you know it's something you like because you're the one that bought the cheese advent calendar. I have basically a rapid fire question. So it's called Speed uh-huh. Dating. With Elsa. You and I are going to go on a very romantic date. I lit a candle. I've created ambience. But it's basically five rapid questions. Are you ready? Okay, sure. Right. Go for it. What's the clumsiest moment you've ever had? So when I was taking my venomous reptile hand, my venomous reptile handling certification test, the person who was holding the middle of the cobra flunked the test, dropped the middle of the cobra and ran out of the room, at which point the cobra was pulled out of the hands of the people on the head and the tail, I was on the head, and hit the floor. The cobra was a bit pissed off about that, and I didn't get out of the room fast enough. Um, so that is probably definitely the clumsiest moment I've ever had. So it bit you? Oh, yeah, it was painful as hell. How long until they would have had, like, obviously the anti venom on site? How did, I'm curious about this now. How how did it feel? What happened? So cobras are chewers. Um, most Australian snakes are strikers. But I believe, um, aren't taipans chewers? They latch on and they just gnaw on you to work the venom deeper in. Awesome. Um, So cobras are chewers. And he just grabbed onto my arm and he chewed on me for a while. And. At some point, they got him off my arm. I had already basically blacked out by that point. And I woke up 12 hours later in a hospital bed. It was a fun time. Oh, my gosh. It's so interesting because, as you said, Australian snakes, like we know, like they do, they kind of just strike, bite, and then you've got a couple of minutes, depending what snake it is. So I uh, I went to a reptile park in Melbourne and literally walked in with a letter from my herpetology advisor i did not finish that degree because i have a tropism toward being bitten by venomous snakes and they wanted me to live so just walked in with a letter being like this is sean and she's clumsy as fuck but she is certified and said hey i'm a visiting american herpetologist what can i milk and they handed me a taipan wow is it weird milking them like what you oh, no, not at all 
so you if you if you you hold them behind the head right my hand is the snake's head you hold them behind the head and you press and do not do this if you are not either certified or under supervision but you press the sides of the jaw and they'll they'll pop their fangs and then you just take and you hook them hook the fangs over the mouth of a special kind of cup and kind of tug on the snake very gently and the snake will express its venom into the cup when the snake is done, it will start trying to pull up and you, you let it up and it will fold its fangs back and then you put it into its enclosure and it gets a nice mouse. Wow, that is so cool. Do you own any pet snakes? Out of curiosity. Not currently. Um, I, the kind of snakes I really enjoy spending time with tend to be the larger colubrid species and they are too big for me to safely handle on my own. So right now I have cats. I have an axolotl. Um, her name is Hannibal. And then I have currently two spiny African flower mantises. I had a colony of African, of Australian spiny walking leaves for quite some time, but then they became illegal in the state of Washington because they can't survive here if they get loose, <laughs> if they get loose. So I miss my girls. They, repro they reproduce parthenogenically and they are the most bullshit thing Australia has ever made. There, have you encountered them? They're these big walking insects. They're about, you know, the, the size of the back of my hand and they look like curled up dried leaves and they're covered in little spines. And their first line of defense, if something threatens them, is they freeze. And they're a stick. And then if that doesn't work and you figure out they're not a stick, they start to sway and then they hunker down and they rub their little spikes on you. It's like attack exfoliation. They don't really break the skin and unless you are allergic to them, there's it's just being lightly sandpapered by a pissed off insect. And if that is not enough, if that does not make you leave them alone, they unleash their greatest and most terrifying weapon. They make a spell like warm chocolate chip cookies. Are you serious? I'm serious. You said, I thought the person that I bought them from was lying until the first time somebody bumped their enclosure and it smelled like a fucking cookie store had opened in my living room. Just like vaping hipsters. Mrs. Fields is here. Like, what not? And that is their big Australian defense. They have no venom. They have no weapons. But boy, do they smell like cookies. I never knew that. Like, I know what they are, but I've never seen, like, I'm learning so much today. <laughs> All right, second question. What are the three words that best describe you? Panic, dedicated, vending machine. Vending machine. Is that for Dr. Pepper? Take a quarter in it and shit just comes out. <laughs> We're going to call that a single composite word. Let's do it. What is the song that best describes you? The song that best describes me. Drinking song for the socially anxious by the amazing devil. Oh, I love that. What is, or should I say, who has been your favorite character to write and why? I mean, my favorite character to write across everything has honestly probably been the Lushak in the Toby books because she can't lie so I have to be incredibly ridiculously meticulous about everything uh, to make sure I don't accidentally contradict myself um she is a fun nightmare if I want to step over to the Mira Grant books Dr. Julian Koff who is a sirenologist is a folkloric scientist so that is almost a self-insert she just has a nice time um everything is horrible and then over in comics it would have to be Gwen Stacy uh ghost spider because I've loved her since I was a child what is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about I can pick up swans really yes they like me how do you do that you just walk up to the swan and you pick it up I mean, they like me. The first time I went to Australia, I was taking a tour of the Yuyang Mountains and our tour guide um, took her eyes off me for a moment, which was a terrible move on her part. And she should have figured that out since I had already come back with a large spider, a dead kangaroo and a uh, a lizard that I've forgotten the name of the kind of lizard. But, but she took her eyes off me for a moment as she was explaining the billabong to the rest of the tour group. And I wandered away and came back with a swan. And, and she turned around. I've got this swan and the swan is preening my hair as they'll do. And she goes, you can't have that. And I'm like, well, I pretty well seem to. Um, swan. 
Would you like me to put it down? No, I would not like you to put it down. I would very much not like you to put it down. Okay. Um. Well, not really sure how this ends then. So. That's amazing. I have had so much fun today. What okay. where do we find you? What's um, up and coming? And yeah, what do we need to know? Um, I mean, you can find me right now on Twitter, though I don't know how much longer that will be true. Uh, I am also Sean and McGuire at Mastodon. Um, and uh, I'm on Instagram, as we mentioned, where I am also Sean and McGuire. I am very predictable in that way. My name is hard enough to pronounce. I don't need 73 of them. Uh, my next book comes out in January, and that is Lost in the Moment and Found from Tor.com Publishing, and that's the latest in the Wayward Children series. Then in March, I've got Backpacking Through Bedlam, which is the next encrypted book. And then moving forward to September, we've got um, Sleep No More, which is the next October day book. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. And who knows, uh, maybe watch your space. We might get you on next year as well. Thanks for having me. That's all right. Bye, guys. Bye.